Oh, find out. Hey, this is Coffee Compiler Club. We're here today to talk about compilers and whether or not WASM sucks. This is for Levo's benefit. And, uh, you know, crazy, crazy Discord channel lit off on a couple things. And um, anything and everything to do with compilers and language runtimes and implementations. Uh, all, everyone's being recorded. You show up on YouTube in a couple hours. Uh, that's the end of my spiel. And I think I will do the default open thing here and, and pick up um, Onat on my screen. That's not your name. Would you introduce yourself and say, what do we call you? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Onat, and um, I'm from Turkey. Um, I'm well, I'm very interested in low-level programming, all kinds of computer stuff. Um, like, uh, sorry, <laughs> it's, it's been a while since I, like, you know, did one of these, like, Zoom things. So I'm kind of like, um, but anyway, I, I love programming the GPU and designing languages and, like, um, working with audio and, uh, like, creating beautiful graphics with computers. There you go. Okay. Um, so, so I have a, the open polling question here. Should I tackle the WASM that went on Discord or not? Because there's some obvious miscommunications that went round, but maybe it's a dead horse that's been beaten to death. In I think it's worth I hear going through the short something. version of what is the thesis of why WASM sucks. The, okay, the high level thesis for the, what, what went round and what my take on it are different things. So, so the obvious confusion, so not my take, the obvious confusion was WASM performance sucks because. And then there were a bunch of different things that went around and some of them were like, it currently sucks, therefore it will always suck. It doesn't do SIMD, but maybe it will in the future. It doesn't do garbage collection or safety checks, but maybe it will in the future. Oh, it does do safety checks, but only on the entire process. So. Java can class for name and claim some kind of sandboxing and safety so you can load internet webby stuff and assume that it's going to run in a sandbox and all be good. Whereas WASM loads into the same four gigs. And if you do the one range check for the four gigs, new code you load in could crush old code because you don't range check properly. And then that blows up the entire WASM process, but not necessarily blowing up anyone who owns a WASM execution as a sandbox by itself. So the sandbox is there, but maybe a little coarse. And then the WASM doesn't have range checks, or it does, or it could, or it couldn't, and those will be expensive or not, or whatever. So that was what was running around on Discord. Um, my take on WASM is it loses high-level information, and high-level information, high-level typing information, like you get out of Java or Scala or Okamo or, or whatever, High level C sharp, C plus plus, high level info that you lose, and uh, uh, and then you get profiling data at runtime. You lose the opportunity to mix high level typing info with low level profile data to do all kinds of targeted high level optimizations, and that's exactly what the JVM does. So it has high level typing info, and it has low level profile data. And he totally fucking inlines based on the profiles and the, and the types, or he does uh, uh, guarded inlining, giving he knows that a certain class is common, so he'll do a type check of a class and then do a guarded inline, things like that will go on. So he does a bunch of high-level, low-level mixing things, and WASM doesn't have the high-level info. So as a replacement for a code generator at the backside of LLVM, sounds fine you'll get what you get out of, say, LLVM. Does LLVM beat Java running Java code? Not. Does LLVM do a pretty good job on, say, low-level C code? Yes. So, it, it you know, there's, there's, there's some, you know, it's fine in this domain and not in others, and that's reasonable. So that was my take. It loses high-level type info before it comes up with a profiling info. Here is all the regulars are just piling in. I will deal with counting. So... I think it's worth going back to why does WASM exist and what are the promises that they are trying to make and or keep? Oh, that's fair. I don't know. So like the yeah. history is Google had their project, which was NACL. They wanted to make native code safe. So let's find some way to compile your native code in such a way that an analyzer can look at it, go, you didn't violate memory safety. When, when was We NACL? can run uh, 2009. I don't know, a while ago. 
Because that came way after like Asm.js, right? Right. Mozilla's solution was, why don't we write gadgets that are the equivalents of the assembly instructions oh, in JavaScript and just recognize those patterns and replace them with the one instruction. So now you could take something that was assembly, compile it to JavaScript, then the thing could look at the JavaScript and compile it back into the assembly that it was right. before I you compiled it to JavaScript. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was ASM.js. Let's write assembly in JavaScript V8 when they started running their crankshaft optimizer actually did pretty well on the ASMJS, even before it had any special code that was looking at it, because those things were basically assembly instructions and the optimizer cleaned them out and people pulled them down and they turned into the assembly instructions. Right. So Wasm's goal was, okay, compiling to JavaScript to then compile the JavaScript back into assembly clearly seems to be a better plan than NACL and is better adopted by the web, but is also super painful. Why don't we just make a assembly language for the web that is a nice target that can be targeted by compilers. So their most important promise is you don't escape. We are going to say, here is your block of memory and you're doing a whole bunch of Turing complete things in your block of memory and you're not erasing the hard drive because we didn't give you hard drive permissions. Like its point was to be a hard sandbox that you could compile anything that could be compiled to assembly to WASM and it would run with kind of assembly like speeds or at the very least better than compiling it to ASMJS and then compiling that back <laughs> into assembly. Yeah, yeah. So it may not have instructions for doing SIMD stuff. They are promising they're not going to remove any instructions. Anything that targets WASM will always target WASM. They're only going to add instructions from here. They may or may not add those instructions in the future, but they are hesitant to add any instructions they don't need because... Once you add an instruction, someone on the web might be using it and you can never remove it again. So they want to be very, very careful that they're adding the right instructions that they ever add instructions. I mean, nowadays- When you say something like testing. the JVM is doing high level compiling, my guess is the answer you would get from the WASM team is, right, the thing that your JVM should do is compile the JVM to WASM and run that inside WASM and let it run the code and compile things down into WASM that the WASM can then execute in a nice hard sandbox. Yeah. So if you think you only gave me half of an interpreter, they would say, yeah, sure, fine. I gave you a sandbox. My goal was to give you a sandbox that runs stuff fast. If you want all the nice things that come from nice interpreters, build the second half on top. That's my sort of perception of what the promises of WASM are. Feel free to throw tomatoes at me if you disagree. I think that's probably correct. I do think that there's the downsides of that that are difficult to deal with. Like one thing is, you know, if you end up with the same interop story as you would for a native platform, then you actually get a lot of, it's it's actually worse in a lot of ways because of the the nature of the web, right? That like, oh, you can't, download and pre-install the JVM in any meaningful way, you kind of just grab the JVM version and all of the framework on the first load of the web page. And it's like, oh, that sucks because that's going to really hurt. Um, but then for also, every web page that needs one. Exactly. Right. Um, so you get this, you get this kind of explosion. And then when you start thinking about, okay, how am I going to do interop between things with two like two garbage collected languages uh -huh. you have all of the negatives of of how you do interop between two garbage collected languages on native things today without any of the benefits that are not usually provided by the operating system like the operating systems do actually provide quite a lot for interop on their platform and WASM just doesn't because it's not an OS in some sense. So it's like, oh, okay. So I have all these problems. Then I have the whole set of like, oh, and now I'm my, my own operating system. And that's like, that's terrible. And then the last bit that makes it really rough is that the WASM um, uh, ISA is just like a lot worse than most common native ISAs. Like it doesn't actually have a lot of the the very neat um, threading uh, and and um, synchronization primitives that are common in most popular ISAs, 
which makes actually implementing some of the more advanced garbage collection stuff really hard. I, I would have said you couldn't do garbage collection, but it's right. unrelated to to the ISA. It's related to having somebody else poke through the heap and and do something meaningful about it. Well, there's that, but you also like, you don't really have threads. So you don't really have threads in the same way. So you can't do that. But then even if you did have threads in the same way, they don't have all of the memory bar barrier primitives, okay. obviously because they don't have threads, but like those memory barrier primitives are kind of essential to implementing a lot of really high performance garbage collection stuff. So, so a Java memory model could be implemented by WASM and would only need as a memory barrier-like effect the same thing that Volatile was supposed to give you in the land of C, the Volatile and the Java spec. So you need a, you need a Volatile read and a Volatile write and, and a guarantee that the hardware, the WASM hardware, quote, quote, hardware, will give you the JMM, and now you could do a reasonable GC. You could do a reasonable one. It's just that it Part won't be quite true, as let me, good. Let me restate it. that. As far as I know, short of the, the, the stack crawling thing is a separate issue. The thing that you would get there is um, you only need those barriers to do like a, a ZGC or a, a, a Zool C4 collector and, and fast concurrent background GC. But then there's a stack crawl thing, which their model is the heap, but you have to model stacks to do GC stack crawls. And so that's, that's an issue I don't know how to deal with. I mean, is I think the sorry for like uh, interluding, but like I think the question is, do we go for like a different simpler model or more like a complex like model where like I think garbage collection is like essentially unnecessary complexity, and like in worst case, it could be emulated on like software side if if needed. But like uh, oh. you know, I I think like Vasim's problems are like okay, I cannot do like indexing on memory, so the compiler has to do optimizations like. Okay, if this is like an indexable address, like in the addressing modes, uh, like you ha the compiler has to do that versus like in my language, which is also like a stack based language. Um, I just support indexing on memory directly because like I know that for all the arch architectures that I'm interested in, I can generate those directly. But like WASM is built so that it can run on like as many stuff as possible. So it's, it's kept as basic as possible instead of like maybe like a, a thing could be like, okay, we support like more complex operations, but then they are emulated where they're not supported on like exotic ar architectures or we just don't run them at all. On, like... So, so let, let, me, let me break down a couple of different things you said there. The sure. generating addressing modes is a very easy, very, I want to say localized process. It's instruction selection. And yeah. uh, I'm sorry, I'm Jim, really it's to pop up on my screen. Way. Like, I'm, I'm full explicit everything, like, write most code and, like, suddenly that you know how it's being generated instead of, like, doing optimizations, uh, kind of, like... Okay, so, so what I'm trying to say with addressing modes is they'll happen correctly almost every time with any effort on, an, on a code generator size, which WASMs in any of the browsers will be well past the threshold. So you'll get really good addressing modes out of WASM without any problem. That doesn't count for garbage collection. It doesn't matter about garbage collection. It's a sort of unrelated issue. Because I think I checked, like, sorry for interrupting, but like I checked some code generators and it, like, it was like, okay, because the WASM spec states that this is like, should be like a byte aligned load or store like memory access, like, you know, this should be like calculated instead of like using the proper addressing mode, like calculating the address and then doing that from like an indirect register, like, so, Which... okay. so, so I, I, I'm, I'm way more suspicious that you find a naive WASM code generator than the WASM spec denying the ability to use an addressing mode. Oh, okay, yeah. So that, that I think is what's going on you there. You can totally Whereas... use addressing modes. It, like I, I do it in my WebAssembly interpreter. Um, I, I'm not even a just-in-time, like mine isn't just-in-time, I just have instructions that are like like you know you're doing an add a multiply and then a and then a load oh we can just collapse all that into one and yeah, yeah. WebAssembly doesn't specify either way it basically has the same memory constraints as x86 if you remove the simd like you know load aligned stuff it, it basically is like you can hint that like yeah if it's eight by line yeah that's faster but if it's not still gonna work 
Um, yeah. And and you can do addressing modes just in the instruction selector. You can even do like a pre-pass optimizer on the WebAssembly because you can't mutate modules like you can at like most assemblies. You can't like write to the buffer that is executing essentially. Um, it makes it so that in like the MVP of WebAssembly in WebAssembly 1.0, there is basically no issue generating like the nice little like native x86 or native ARM loads and stores from a sequence of WebAssembly instructions. It, it often is that like a WebAssembly instruction is like a quarter of an x86 instruction, a third, a half. They're, they're oftentimes not like ever implemented. Like, like Chrome cannot, it's, it's optimizing compiler actually doesn't do any of the stack stuff. It just statically figures it out like you would expect it to. It puts yeah. it in registers and then register allocates. And it doesn't end up being a stack machine at the end of the day. It ends up being a register machine where the registers just move around because you can't pass in arbitrary registers to something. It, it gets a certain number of stack slots, which are just registers by, by number, essentially, instead of named registers or like, it, it's registers that, that automatically get rid of themselves. And it, it makes lifetimes easier, but the instruction selection is not any much harder. And that doesn't really have to do with GC. The hard part of WebAssembly GC is that the stack is just completely opaque, entirely opaque. Okay, that's what I was wondering. And even the GC proposal for WebAssembly doesn't make the stack transparent. It just says, oh yeah, yeah, there are these other operations. If you want to do GC stuff, just compile these other instructions. It doesn't even let you do classical GC. It's like, yeah, this is like a pointer to some random thing that is outside of your heap. It's a little scary. I'm like, this is this is a pointer to what now? And it's well, like that would be a native similar. pointer. You're not a yeah, native but pointer, it, but you say you can't. You, he doesn't let you have a peek through a, a stack contained pointer that goes back into the WASM heap. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you can't do that. You, the okay. Stack to WASM heap is uninspectable. Um, stack to custom heap, which is the JavaScript heap, which is like V8's yeah. garbage collector or spider monkeys. Yeah, it can do that with the garbage collection proposal. But like there's a SIMD proposal and a garbage collection proposal and a threading proposal, and none of them really do what you want. Gotcha. Um, yeah. So I was I was I was, I was thinking WASM, the state of WASM was sort of by yeah. spec, by design, it's not currently allowing, for instance, GC. Yes. There it doesn't there allow is... for like you to port it. Sorry. Uh, no, sorry, I was just gonna add that there's I believe there is a separate stack where you can store variables whose references are taken. So you can kind of like on the side, like keep a book list of the things that you are can, live. You can implement like, your own good stack, Lord. yes. Yeah. <laughs> you can put yeah, your own right. stack on the heap. Right. The problem with implementing your own stack, a stack on the heap, yeah, is usually, it's usually inefficient and can't be compiled down to fast code no matter what you do. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't use RSP like the, the WebAssembly stack does on x86. Right. It uses right. like some other general purpose register, which we can't push and pop to. Good luck. It, right. It's just kind of, I mean, it just kind of, isn't that what there. every compiler does? Like the ARM chip doesn't have a stack explicitly. It yeah, gives you a block of memory yeah, and yeah. you decide here, I'm going to make a stack and I'm going to make a heap. And um, I, I guess, but like there are still operations that'll be faster and more optimized. Like if you use the suggested stack registers on ARM, it'll save you a cycle. Just by the, pushing and popping from them the instead of from other the registers. Stack because... is it's not stored in linear memory. So you can't walk it through linear yes. memory, which means you can't directly store, you can't directly lock, walk the stack for yeah. references into a GC heap. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like it's, the, the, it's the, optimal. It's just not, it's just they don't optimize for this case as heavily as they optimize for you're just using the WebAssembly stack versus a WebAssembly stack on the heap. Um, yeah, so this would be like the garbage collector implementation wants to know about the implementation of the WebAssembly bits so that you can go back and forth. That's fine. I, I think WebAssembly is WebAssembly. for what it is or what it's intended to be. It, um, it's basic. I think it's like it just you have to keep more stuff. It it narrows that space of like thinking about a garbage collector as like a hybrid between like a ref counting system and like a tracing system, right? It pushes you more towards the ref counting trade-offs because you end up keeping much more 
bookkeeping operations per every operation. Yeah. So it looks a lot more like you basically do ref release, like acquire release, but you don't get the benefits of it, right? So it, there's a pay that you pay for something that you're not actually getting the benefits of. There is a certain, um, on the stack, you have this knowledge of like, like C calls it restrict, other languages like do other things with it. Rust just calls it what everything is. Um, but the WebAssembly heap, you can't say, I am the only one who is looking at this. I am the only object that has this memory address because somebody else could say, yeah, I'm gonna write there. And you're like, oh, please don't do that. And they do it anyway. And it has to work in that case because what if that's what you wanted? And it makes it slower just having to do the checks and then optimize later. Even if the optimizing compiler can figure it out, it's still the baseline compiler figures it out most when you do the way they want you to. When you do the if garbage your goal is case, to be a target for arbitrary compiled C. Yeah, so C is no like, question. Yeah. Also, C on WebAssembly has to use its own stack if you ever use a loca. Like if you ever do oh, dynamic really? stack allocation or like VLAs or like yeah. anything like that, it, or like var args, yeah. it has to make its yeah. own stack and pass that around as a parameter, yeah. which is like, gotcha. guys, no. It's, yeah. it's so do you think WebAssembly should have just never had a stack at all? I think WebAssembly would be better if you could just like get a pointer to the, if there were two heaps, one is your actual heap and one is what we put on the stack. Yeah. And you don't even need to put the return addresses on the stack. All you have to put on it is the values the user can see. Declared... And there have been proposals for this and they've been yeah. shot down. A declared stack thing that is peak and pokeable yeah. by the runtime WASM already. Yes. And if it crushes it, you crush your WASM process just the same as you crush it when you crush your WASM process for bugs in your WASM assembly. Yeah, is but Chrome, Chrome objected, Google objected to this. Chrome did specifically. Uh, the, one of the teams was like, no, we can't have this because it would slow it down by 0.5%. <laughs> And, and you could just there, make variables. Just stop, you could just go. opt into it. You could it, just it, opt it, into it. It does feel like this is a very, but WASM in the current, to go back to like the previous yeah. statements I made about interop, if you want a system which provides effectively a, a web-based ISA for arbitrary compilation, then I think you make different trade-offs than if you want people to basically compile C code into uh, WebAssembly for use in optimization routines. And it definitely feels like at the moment, WASM is very good at the latter and not so good at the former. Yeah, um, one is, one is interop. a code and the other is a back end. Yeah, low right. IR. Yeah, and WASM is trying to be a byte code and an IR at the same time. Yeah. Which All I wouldn't right. have thought there was a lot of tension to until we started talking about it. And it's like, oh, maybe we, there is a tension between a bytecode and an IR. Are, are we, are we, are we you ready to declare this horse beaten to death? Uh, not yet, I think. Like, you know, <laughs> I want, I want like, uh, I don't want like a automatic register allocator. I want to be able to allocate my own registers and like not have to pass like the same Why pointer to the next row. Function, function. Why don't we just argue about this for the rest of the meeting and call it there? No, 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 no. We're not going <laughs> to have to go that. So, so, so there is a specific thing he said here that can be specifically addressed, and that WASM is machine independent, registers are not. So you can't do register allocation in WASM, but you can in assembly. And so you have to decide you're looking at assembly or you're looking at a portable assembly-like thing. You use registers? I mean, are you running on an x86 or an ARM? Or... You could say like, okay, you. I mean, yeah, that's the question, right? I mean, I thought about this a lot, and then like, uh, maybe you could just say like, okay, here's minimum eight registers, okay? Eight registers like are, we can support for like custom register allocation for like eight contexts is a lot. I mean, if you can <laughs> add, like address like four gigabytes in one pointer, right? Like that's like a lot of program state that you can access like at any given time. But, but okay, what what is the goal of demanding some particular set of registers get mapped through the WASM? I, I give you give you a first heads up. Having been a compiler engineer for roughly forty years now, um, eight is on the low end of barely acceptable. 
And there's significant gains going to 16 and significant gains going to 32, but not so significant and not a whole lot of gains going to 64. So it's pretty recently. low. And in the land of, of taking other people's registers and re-register allocating them, I would always get significant gains if you gave me eight registers you hardwired and I got to freely remap them, which I have done that before. I always get gains. So I claim yeah. you saying I only needed eight and I want to fix eight. I'm just going to ignore your registers anyhow and reallocate them to my own set of registers out of a larger pool and win. But, Intel but what, recently, what about the calling um, convention? Like, are you keeping it or not? Um, well, the convention would be, I think, like contextual, right? For some context, I have like these registers that I have mapped to these like objects or like okay. you know, object doesn't like, you know, okay, and like oh, consider this, I don't okay? Know. Intel has twice re doubled the number of registers they used, uh -huh. okay? Yes. They recently released APX, like the spec for APX. They're going to have 32 registers on x86 because 16 wasn't enough. How do you think eight's going to be enough? Now, can, no, wait, so, so stop with the eight versus not. I want to go to the API question. If I own both sides of the API, Andy, I can change the calling convention and you can't tell. And in fact, Java does that. 100% and C Sharp doesn't explicitly because we want to be able to bit bounce in and out of native code with zero cost. And that is one of the main architectural differences between .NET and Java. Java is like, we, yes, I'm fine paying yeah. more for native interop. And .NET is like, I want transparent native interop all the time. Most of the costs for native interop in Java is being GC uh, hardened, hardened for GC. Yeah. The register shuffle happens. It's generally very cheap, cheap on modern chips. We have to not let native code have pointers to garbage collected things because they will hold on to those pointers and then break and then scream when their code broke and the GC moved it. This has been a long, hard burn problem with Java that was fixed by handing you handles. So every native call handleizes everything, flags the stack as crawlable so we can do GC while you're off in native land doing fucking blast routines for five days, things like that, whatever happens there. So those are the costs. The argument shuffle is just, it's just cheaper in general for Java, at least, to shuffle the arguments over native. Yeah, uh, I got, you I said got the CLR, saves. even if you're calling from jitted code to jitted code, leaves the calling convention alone? Um, I, I have gone back and forth. It, there is no, no technical reason why I couldn't change calling convention from jitted to jitted on, an, on a call-by-call -call basis. If I just did a greedy, eager, this method wants its arguments here because it calls this guy who wanted his arguments there and everyone just took different arguments according to the first guy, I bet you there'd be significant gains made. Having said that, the, the jitted calling convention is one that doesn't do support for var args. It keeps doubles and double registers. All the conventions at the time were putting doubles in, in int registers for var arg support, whatever crappy things. A bunch of things went on that just straightened out. Um, but it's the jitted calling convention is not the native one. And then there's another calling convention that register allocators totally aware of for calling various runtime machine coded stubs, uh, hand coded assembly stubs. So there's hand coded stubs, they have different conventions for every stub. The register allocator knows about them. The JIT to JIT has another convention, JIT to native has another convention, and the register allocator just reads the convention whenever he's picking out what registers he's going to use for what he's calling. It's all fine. Uh, I got two questions for Andy. Mm -hmm. uh, do you happen to know what's the performance between, uh, I mean, how good uh, C Sharp or uh, .NET performs uh, compared to Java? And my other question is, uh, do you Boy, guys uh, heavily rely on native libraries? Do, do, it, do the first one first. It's just fine. It you totally depends. It depends on your workload. So it, for a long time, um, Java had a big advantage in uh, absolute throughput because .NET didn't do on stack replacement. Um, so it didn't do a lot of the very big optimizations. Now it does do on stack replacement. So that advantage is narrowing. Um, and I still think that it's going to be dependent upon particular workloads. And then to the other answer, yeah, the one of the biggest differences is .NET bounces in and out of native code all the time like huge amounts of .NET core routines are actually implemented in C++ and .NET bounces in and out of C++ constantly 
in order to do to like get high performance gadgets for a variety of different things, including what we like call like basically JIT intrinsics, which are just bunk methods that are actually implemented in C++, but they're implemented with a little bit of relaxed cooperation with the runtime, where mm -hmm. the runtime doesn't really know exactly what's going on, but because the calling convention says everything's fine if you just bounce in and out of native code, then it all works. Um, this has also historically been, I mean, like this is a very specific decision. It's like, okay, .NET has, was built explicitly for the, it's okay to call into native code all the time and, and have half your process in native code. It's okay to store GC tracked pointers in yeah. native code and then bring them back actually. Um, so it, there's like a whole bunch of stuff that goes on there. Um, and that we pay for it. I, I would say that this is one of the biggest costs in development. Um, writing a JIT is not that bad. Writing a JIT that that actually keeps the st system calling convention uh -huh. all the time for all the platforms is very expensive. It means bring up on a new platform is really expensive because it's not just porting your existing JIT code. It's like porting your existing JIT code plus tar retargeting to the system calling convention for the new platform. Okay, so so I have to contrast this with my experience with C2. We, we made it portable for calling conventions as one of the very early things went on. So there is a file that describes calling conventions. And once that file is sort of parsed and interpreted, um, the, the C2 has no trouble. And then there's a bunch of signature changers and that's another thing that gets supported, but it's not a big one. It just reads a signature in one language as a string and a second signature for the, the target in. And he spits out machine code to do the register shop. And then that trampoline is available for everybody. Um, it covers a lot of the ground that I heard you talking about. And I guess Java also has a lot of things we would call milli code, which is this relaxed calling convention where we call directly into milli code knowing that it we can store GC or GC pointers or we don't have to handleize. Those are direct calls, similar to what you're talking about. But I don't think we go in and out of that kind of code nearly as often as what you just described. Like you take yeah, a lock yes. and it's a slow path lock, that's milli code. You slow path allocation, that's milli code. There's, there's a bunch of these things, but they're not 50% by any means. And the, out of curiosity, are you doing anything targeting ARM with SVE? Uh, I, as far as I know, so that's, that's arm V seven, right? Or nine V nine. I'm V nine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I seem to remember discussions on it. Um, I don't work on the JIT. So that's like, I leave that to another team. They handle that for me. Made me think so about it when I you mentioned you... conventions, because it has this funny feature called streaming SVE, where you can enable or disable different instruction subset. So different instructions are legal or illegal, depending on whether you start or stop this mode. And I was wondering how to manage this across the JIT and native code boundaries. Because this could be fun where you have, you could start yeah. the streaming command on one side and switch on the other. And how do you bootkeep that is an interesting yeah, problem. Luckily, I get um, Andy Ayers on the JIT team to think about that for me. Uh, the I think that the answer is to some extent, um, some of it is not as difficult as it initially sounds because there are some lines in the spec about, oh, you actually have to do this more often than you think. Um, but I, I don't remember. Sorry, I, I wasn't in Fair enough. detail. So if I gave each of you a vaguely risk arm like chip and said, great, port the JVM and the CLR to this chip, how many months would that take respectively? Um, it's now mostly done. So if you give me something vaguely ARM-like, it, it depends on how vaguely it is, right? Uh, now fair. that um, I would say, you know, our, the initial ARM port was very difficult, or rather it took, I want to say it took close to a year. Uh, and then the Lungsung port took, which was done externally, but uh, I believe that one took close to a year. Um, and then somebody is doing risk five bring up now. And because that's very, very close to Lung Sung, I think it's taking 
much less time. And if it were done internally, I think it would take much, much less time. Um, but I'd still say it's probably on the order of a couple months of work. So when I went to Azul and did the port to the Azul chip, I had already ported x86 16-bit, x86 32-bit, x86 64, Spark 32, Spark 64, Itanium, and ARM. So it took about a month to do the Azul chip, not counting any of the special new features. Um, the special new features took much longer according to what the feature was. There were a couple that were like, like the, the transactional memory took quite a while to do something useful with, but like just getting the registers compiled, the code generator spitting code out, calling conventions going, some Millie code rewrites, these things were all done in about a month. We were we were up on jitted TXU code well before we had actual hardware and were running it purely on simulation for almost a year before we actually had hardware. So that just the difference yeah. there. My, my impression, my impression is it's cheaper for for Java to port to new architectures than it is for .NET. We probably have less native code as well than you do. That has to be. Ported. There's quite there's quite a lot of native code, and a lot of this is like, oh, let's get our native code to compile. Let's get our C plus right. plus compile to the target architecture. Yeah, the first thing in a way that we port GCC the to the target architecture. I didn't count that in there, but somebody ported GCC to the target architecture. And that, it didn't take that long, but they had to port it. And so they knew how to port GCC. So there you go. Yeah, I'm just thinking about the experience I had at a previous company where we wanted to start using ARM servers. And we found that on the JVM, we moved a whole bunch of complicated Scala code to ARM and it just ran. Just ran yeah. And we yeah. moved a whole bunch of node code to ARM and it was like, couldn't find the binary for everything. Please recompile the world. Why is there all this stuff in NPM in which the C code doesn't actually compile if you try to compile from scratch? It claims to be the source code, but it lacks something. Yes, works on my machine. What's what's that? What's that? Yeah, works for me. It's like the released binary works great, but if you actually yeah. try to compile it yourself, it's just like, uh, no. What do you mean you're not on x86? There's chips out there that aren't x86. Uh huh. All the world's not a vax. That was what I'd the prior that... <laughs> universe was. It, it also depends on whether or not you want it to be full performance or not. So uh, um, uh, we've found that uh, w like there's a huge amount of benefit to using very specific instruction selection for x86 and for ARM. And it's not like just the standard stuff. It's like the SIMD stuff, right? Um, and that stuff usually needs a fair amount of handholding. Yeah, and I mean, that takes a long time to port. If you want to grab, if you want to get full performance out of the fundamental ISA, then you're going to spend a lot of time working through that stuff, like probably years. And it's not just because it takes a long time to port. It's because like somebody smart needs to look at the thing and be like, how can I possibly make this as fast as I, as fast as I can using all of the tools at my disposal. And then, there are very few people who can do that work. So you like get backed up behind like the one or two people who know enough about .NET yeah. and enough about target architecture. What's your, what do you think the, the performance gain is for that from the, from the initial cut to the, I've tweaked the instruction selection registers. So we keep getting just talking about like JIT intrinsics because JIT intrinsics is the way that we they mostly end up targeting all of the like AVX 512 stuff, oh, God. right? Yes, right. So if you talk about that, then we keep getting like yearly 10% performance improvements from JIT intrinsics, right? On, like we on just keep stacking. Are, but but on, thing, on code that's using that intrinsic specifically. Yes, although what we do is we like change the framework to utilize a new intrinsic. And then we keep getting like, oh, okay. string processing is 10% faster or something, right? right. And yeah, we right. keep getting those year after year of like, oh, we, we did a whole n another set of like yeah. intrinsics, like uh, figuring out this thing and then using it in the framework and then boom, everything's 10% faster again. So I don't even know what the stopping point is. Like we have not yet yeah. reached right. the end of returns on that investment. That's that's yeah. Yeah, but I'm kind of okay with that. Cause if I'm trying a new architecture, 
you know, we were switching to ARM because we found that the ARM servers meant that we spent a tenth as much on the air conditioning bill. Right. And it was like the win, like the fact that it worked at all was enough that we would switch over for our like 10x win. That's and it's it, yeah. okay to get the sort of gradual 3% a year forever after that. Like, so if you got right. it, I don't and need those switch. to switch immediately. I just demand them eventually. <laughs> kind of, right? So here's the, the, here's the problem though. Think about it from the other perspective of like, you're on x86, you've got five iterations of intrinsic specialization for x86. You switch over to ARM day one, you've got zero years. Yes, the ARM maybe is, the ARM hardware is maybe cheaper per watt or like, you know, you spend less watts on your straightforward stuff, but you get lower throughput. So now you have to balance out of like, okay, my if in order to achieve the same throughput as I was on x86, I have to purchase larger quote unquote ARM hardware in order to meet that goal. And now the watt comparison no longer looks as good. And so you have to wait another two, three years before the but, ARM hardware achieves the same level of performance in this, the code. This should happen. This should be a, a math number, not not a hard problem. Like if if you truly get a tenfold reduction in AC bill straight up, but then you have to run twice as much ARM cycles to to do the same performance, you still have a 5x reduction in your AC bill. Right. I was just saying this this math should be totally doable. Yeah. It, it it's one hundred percent doable. The problem is that ARM hardware isn't like a constant, right? <laughs> well, uh, neither is x eighty six. Right, it, totally. I, that that, and that's why I'm just saying it's like going to depend a little bit on your workload, and and yeah. more than your workload, it's going to depend on which machines yeah. you have access to and what they cost. And yes, yes. No, oh, I think that's awesome. also a minor side note. In 2020, it suddenly became much harder to buy large numbers of x86 CPUs, which was not true of ARM. Oh, really? Oh, interesting. We had pandemic supply chain oh. issues that also pushed us to move workloads to ARM to free up x86s for loads that we could not move to ARM at all. Yeah. Are you talking about physically buying ARM machines or buying time on like AWS? No, we were physically trying to buy CPUs and we were told by our salesperson Google has agreed to pay the contract break fee with you so that they can have the x86 CPUs instead of you. And they paid us the contract break free and walked away. We were like, but we, we, want the we chips. planned on getting those CPUs. Not that we don't want the contract break fee. We want the chips. Um, yeah. So we bought a bunch of ARM chips because yeah. they were available on the market and you could put them into boxes. Yep. Oh, was this Twitter? No comment. <laughs> Yeah, and so, probably can't say. <laughs> but that, but that's like a good answer for you know, um, ARM chips in general. Of like, uh, what what thing are you buying? Are you buying the equivalent of Graviton three? Okay, you're buying it from Amazon. Like, you can't buy that anywhere else. Um, yeah. Uh, I heard that um, certain intrinsics uh, helped FFmpeg a lot more. Uh, on x86 than ARM. So for FFmpeg, you want to run it on a x86 uh, CPU. So I'm kind of wondering what other workloads uh, would use Intrinsics uh, much better. Because I thought ARM was a pretty good uh, ISA. Uh, so like some some stuff that uses Intrinsics, like mem copy <laughs> at this point. Like it, it's... There's yeah, no... yeah, but um, ARM has a pretty good memory copy. So I was just really surprised that uh, Neon was like not as good as x86, but maybe uh, they botched their benchmark because I was pretty sure that ARM performs as good as x86, uh, like on a per wattage uh, uh, basis. But I don't well, know, I was, I was just really to surprised was like, to hear it. It's, it's uh, up until recently, mem copy didn't use vectorized instructions. Um, and and well, it didn't use all vectorized instructions on all processors, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a it's a combination of like both what your workload is, but also what your compiler support is, plus what your library support is. So for FFmpeg, you might see very different results simply because they've spent a lot of time optimizing for x86, Maybe spent that's a lot it. of time benchmarking for it, et cetera, et cetera, and then. It's not that ARM doesn't have that stuff. It's just that they haven't spent the work to like go look and yeah. do the same thing. No, that sounds more uh, like uh, that sounds more. Uh, 
I, I believe that more. And uh, Neon was really good uh, instruction set. Like I really liked using Neon when I wrote it in my compiler. Are we also the Fourier transforms in FF in MPEG encodings is very sensitive to like stride lengths and cache sizes a and a bunch of things. Yes. Yes. There's a lot of things where it's really nice to have a lookup table at the very beginning that says, if the CPU is this CPU, use this set of magic numbers. Yeah. Yeah. It, DST in general is like one of the canonical examples of where, you know, vectorized instructions can help you a lot. So I bet that it's just very sensitive to everything. And if you want to achieve peak performance, then you're going to just need to like do a lot of work to make sure that your DST implementation matches your architecture's benefits in exactly the right way. And I'm absolutely not the right person to talk about, like find a game developer, right? <laughs> like that, this is all they do all day long. I've played some of these games in the past and yeah, there's very sensitive things going on. A lot of these and whether or not you have this instruction available or not, and you got, yes, cache line alignments and this and that. And it's kind of a, I'm going to say it's a, it's a look good on the benchmark game, but in, in sort of real life where people are running shit, they don't get all these factors to align up perfectly every time. So you never get the benchmark numbers unless you just spend your life trying to align your application to the, instructions and the like it, it's it's a you can make the damn benchmarks look amazingly good but in real life getting those numbers out is usually pretty hard but you can get close I know the youtube team spent a lot of time trying to get all the numbers right for video transcoding they, they probably do and that's their yeah that's their life so yes i can believe they get them but if i were to try to do the same thing i probably would you know pivot and do something else for a while and spend my my precious brain cycles somewhere else no, that that's the that's totally a personal decision. Some people absolutely love that stuff, right? Like that's their favorite thing to do. So, I'm happy for them. All right, are we gonna are we ready for a, a pivot here? I was going to demo some uh, uh, stuff we were doing with the simple project, which has Fire reached away. a point where there's some interesting graphics. Fire away! Fire away! So let's see, the right way to do this is I have a, I don't know. Okay, so I have, we have a very simple language. It's all on purpose. It's a demo for sea of nodes. And I was trying to go look at, let me pull up. Oh, here we go. Let me probably do it this way. Let me attempt a screen share and then come back here. Zoom, where did Zoom go? And then I'll have to go start doing the right things with screen share. And then Zoom is blocking the top of my browser. So let me go try graph this. And let me go pull up simple, no, not there, simple. So GitHub on the screen. Uh, which one did I grab? I grabbed a, hey, that's not what I wanted. Try again. Yeah, here we go. Okay, chapter five. Chapter five, looking at source, main test, test. Yeah, okay, so this is readable by people. Here's some sample simple code yeah. I highlighted in blue. So it just says uh, arg is a is a passed in argument from main. There is no main yet because we're not parsing. We just have if statements and standard expressions defining new variables. Pound show graph is a pragma that says dump the people optimizer at that point in time. So int a uh, is a one argument is tested a is arg plus two else a is arg minus three show the graph and then i'll show the graph after you close the if and return and show again and let me pull up the graph for that which should be here so it's not very fast demo because i haven't practiced getting it in and out Graph is, no, give me graph is online. Come on. Failed online. Yeah, here, good enough. 
die, die again. Uh, yes, and V. No, he failed to copy here. Try again. Okay, fine. So, so what I have here is I've parsed uh, A equals arg plus two and A equals arg minus three with an if test. There's two scopes in play. There's a scope where I do on the left-hand side where I have the box at the bottom left is a scope level zero has control and in the initial arg that comes from main and a scope level one, which only defines an A. And the A is currently pointing the blue dash to an add of arg plus two. On the right-hand side bottom box, I have three scopes that are active at the moment, of which one of them doesn't do anything. And then I have an A in scope one is to the right-hand side an arg of uh, arg minus three. And that's, I haven't yet closed the thing, that the if, so I'm gonna close the if. And then I'll show you some peepholes during parsing in a second here. But let's look at this just to get a feel for it. If I can come up to the next guy. Do -do -do. And I failed my cut and paste job. Why? Yes, here. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So here we've closed the closed the if statement. So now there's a region, and there's a fee of for the variable a. It merges arg minus three and arg plus two, and there's an if statement and it looks pretty straight up. And if I go to the third round, I close off the scopes and get rid of them. And I have a final program here, which now maybe by now I've got tuned up. And it just stop points to return from the bottom going up to a region of a fee of blah, 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 blah. So does that all make obvious sense? No, no comments from anybody. So let it ride. I think so. What's the what's your um, framework doing there? The, it's, the, the it's Java framework. To, yeah. the, so so what I'm doing here is I am reading simple uh, simple IR, and I didn't have what did I do? Oh, here we go. Over here, I was looking at this code, mm -hmm. and I'm now and, and I'm I'm parsing it in a very short program and the demo is building an SSA form from text directly. Oh, interesting. And then, and then people optimizing as I'm building SSA. So this is mid parse. I was mid building SSA form. I'm coming out with SSA and optimizing while I'm parsing. So each character as I parse it turns into some IR, which is then optimized as it's parsed. And okay, this is so where... you're, not, you're not like building an intermediate lower yeah. form first you're just directly building an ssa ir as you parse okay yes this is what c2 does with java bytecodes it directly builds an ssa form as it parses bytecodes but it doesn't have to be bytecodes it can be arbitrary right you're write. bypassing bytecodes and going directly from some higher level yeah thing well right i'm showing that you can go straight to ssa from anything not just from bytecodes it can be from raw text too yes but i'm going straight to ssa so I have a, another one here. I'm going to do merge B. Let me find merge B here. This one has some opportunities for doing optimization. So this is the code. So it's just in here, it's, this is the code, which is int A is R plus one, int B is zero. If do something, something, we want to merge B or merge two? Merge two, we'll do merge two. A little bit more chunky stuff, which means I go over here in my IntelliJ and I run it and it spews out a graph. Oh, I don't have any good in-between states. Here, let me go pull this one out and we'll have to go look at what's going on with it. Uh, and, da, 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 da. and does this language support like forward declaration? Um, the uh, language supports almost nothing right now. Okay. And it, it could eventually support forward declarations and all kinds of stuff. At the moment, it's a tutorial-like thing. So I have ints as the only type and ifs, but no loops yet, but they're coming in the next chapter or two. And I don't have dead test elimination, but that happens during parsing as well for both C2 and for simple here. So here is, how do I get these side by side? Here's the code. The code is A is R plus one, B is R plus two. Great. B equals B plus A, A equals B plus one. So there's gonna be some math involved with numbers of args and adds of twos and threes and fours. 
And uh, at the time I get to the bottom, I have a fee for B that's something about arg plus two or an extra plus here. I don't know how to highlight on my mouse. You guys can see my screen, but can you see my mouse? I can see your mouse. Oh, okay. So there's a B is something plus two, and here's a plus of AB is the merged value that went in and around the fees getting optimized. So there's a four and a five. And it's not necessarily minimal, but it's pretty good for just coming straight out of the parser. And I can break that in the middle and show you graphs in the middle if we'd like to see halfway done what it looks like. So the other thing going on here is at some point, I want to get this to be totally dynamic as I run the peepholes and the parsing. So you can see the text getting parsed and the graph being emitted as it's parsed. But it, it does an interesting amount of optimization while parsing. Um, yeah, it, OK. So I think that would answer my question, which is like, so what do you do with stuff like four declarations that just doesn't functionally matter to the SSA form at the end? Uh, oh, no, I guess the it's just yeah, yeah. optimized out, and then you're like, okay, right. cool. Okay. When I do this on AA, which does do the forward thing, I simply put a note in the graph which says, I'm a forward reference. Okay. And it, it does, it's opaque. It doesn't do anything. It hangs around. Suddenly it gets plugged in. When it gets plugged in, I replace that node with the definition of the forward reference, and then the peepholes clean up at that point. Got it. Okay. Um, I don't know. That was that was the main one here. Show something fun with things going on here. Here's let me do one more and then I'll declare victory or defeat. But it's kind of fun that you can go look at code. So let me go look at this is test merge four. So let me come back over here. Oh, I know how to do this. Um oh I can't get two windows shared. Damn it. All right. I was going to do two windows side by side, but I can only share one at a time, or my entire desktop, which I don't want to do. So here's another one with two ifs in a row, with arg a is one, if arg b is two, return something. And so we get multiple ifs here. No, not that one. This, this. Since you're doing optimization, does this mean that you can't really uh, look at a um, at a granularity smaller than the whole expression or whole statement? Um, I look at the granularity that I get out of the graph, which includes every single time I put a node in, which is certainly every partial expression, sub-expression, expression, if, while, trues, whole functions, all, all levels, all in between. Nice. So can you map back like syntactic sub-expressions to nodes or have you lost like a one-to-one -one relationship? I, I have optimizations that lose a one-to-one -one relation. Okay. So for instance, I'm not doing comments of expression elimination, but when I do, that'll I, be good. I yeah. no longer can go backwards. Now there there is a thing that says, how do I debug? And that's the same story that Java goes through, which is the map back state gets kept alive as inputs to some special node, which looks like a function call. We call it a safe point. It keeps everything alive at the safe point. The allocator and the code generator work to make it as cheap as possible, typically by putting it on an off branch behind a never taken branch by whatever, blah, blah, blah. And they register allocate and they spill. And all the debug info disappears out of your main fast path. But it's all available. So if you take the slow path to go debug because you hit breakpoint, then you execute the slow path that cleans up whatever the optimizer did with whatever things were going on, hands you back the debug state, and you can now do full debugging uh, when you had been running in the optimized code. Oh, fascinating. That's, that That's true of Java all the time, right? That, yeah, that's not at all true of CLR. <laughs> it's uh, definitely a different set of stuff going on. Or at least it's represented in a different way. Like I think actually the fundamentals are probably the same, but the CLR definitely stashes all this stuff in some separate. It, it's not like just it's sitting not there. Not in line. And, yeah. yeah. In in C two, it's all kept in line. Uh, and then when you get done with register allocation and code gen and basic block placement, all that kind of stuff, a lot of the uh, 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 things that you might call debug info become like constants in a table and they don't have to appear in a register or they become like 
reverse engineering uh, an induction variable back to the base value. So there's an add or subtract of constants or a subtract from the base and shift, blah, 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 a little bit of code. And that's all taught to the debug info. So I don't actually have to emit code for it necessarily. And the code can happen that way or not. But then it's, yeah, the allocator, the optimizer just keeps it alive as a, here's a call that I might take someday that takes all these things. So anyhow, and that was it. I was trying to say, hey, we got cool graphs. We can parse you know, ifs and nested ifs and whatever. And I think sometime in a week or two, we'll be doing dead code on dead ifs and that'll be optimizing them while you're parsing as well. And fun stuff. I'm amazed so of how different uh, the C Sharp and Java uh, JIT are. You're interested or you're amazed? Amazed how different <laughs> they are because I thought almost all of it would be the same. And I guess that's what I confused the... Uh, uh, earlier on Discord, when I said, you know, one thing does one thing, and I guess I just didn't realize Java does it differently. Oh yeah, oh yeah. No, I, I there's there's some different philosophical takes, and so there's also you know the current state of CLR and current state of JVM jitting, and these are all moving targets, and so you can expect that maybe they'll very much so, yeah, and also like .NET's just structural. Um, approach of really leaning into ahead of time code generation, uh, which I know that Java is doing a lot more of now. It's funny because it's like Java is doing a lot more of ahead of to code, ahead of time code generation, uh, which it had trans uh, previously didn't seem to do a lot of, and then now the CLR is doing like a lot of on stack replacement and what we call dynamic PGO, and it's like oh that that used to be a Java thing, but now we're doing it too. So uh, may maybe everybody's can just converging. Um, but yeah, historically very different. All right, I guess I'm done with my little demo. Da, da, da. Uh, I just wanted to ask um, Andy, you said uh, on stack replacements. Could you clarify what kind of optimizations that is? Oh, that's stuff like um, uh, it's replacing the stack uh, when you've figured out that you can do some optimization or you can't do some optimization. So in particular, it's like, oh, I'm going to de-virtualize this method because I've seen the call a whole bunch of times and I know it's going to always call this thing. So I'm going to de-virtualize to directly call that thing instead of doing the indirect call. But then every once in a while, you'll hit like, oh, wait, I was wrong. And in both of these cases, you need to effectively take the stack that the current code is running on and swap it out with a new one. And okay. historically, the CLR has actually just not functionally had that capability. It cannot, it could not swap out the currently running stack. Um, and that that was why, as opposed to Java's like interpreter C1, C2, .NET actually had basically one level of jitting there I, that's not completely true there was always like a a differentiation but you basically got the, the one pretty good level of jit for all the code um and that's why java would like have sometimes higher peak performance because it didn't have the the .NET didn't do those kinds of de-optimization or optimizations, de-virtualization, that kind of thing. Optimizations that if something changed in the system, you had to go back and replace the code with some other code. Yeah. 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 Yes. And Java does a lot of that. We get that sorted out a while ago. That sounds like a pain to implement. It's like, I, I tell people it's like, it's not really rocket science. It's a lot of nitpicky detail, but it's not really rocket science. I would say it's also just from a software engineering perspective, it's structural, right? Like you decide whether that's a load bearing assumption of your system uh, kind of upfront. And then if you decide not, then it is, it can be quite hard to retrofit. But if you yeah. come into it, like this is going to be the functional approach of how this works. Then as Cliff says, like you can just kind of, you just do it. It's yeah. it's an, yeah. it's an implementation question, but you know you get good engineers and they just do it. It's but you you go down a particular path and yeah. that decides in some sense. Yeah, I, I can imagine yeah. retrofitting that was a tough call or tough to tough pile of work. As but, always, it's like these software engineering questions of like, do we do this? 
and we're not going to see any benefit until it's done? Or do we do these other things, which we know we could do and we could see benefit immediately? So you, you kind of have to say at some point it's worth doing and we'll spend the however long it takes and not have anything to show for it until it's done. But, right. you know. So the, the job of porting Java to a different architecture includes this stack layout thing that in turn allows, it does, the, the includes in the port maybe, the how you unpack and repack the stack. So that's part of that port description. Um, there is yes. basically we port an iterator over stack frames that allows us to crawl them, do a for start of stack to end of stack, get next frame, to delete a frame, to add this as a frame. Th those are the kind of basics and trends that you port as part of the hardware platform port. And then and then all that DEOP stuff just works on ARM and it works on Spark Windows and Itanium Windows, which are different than Spark Windows, are Azul TXU chips whose window hardware is different again from either of those other two, and so on and so forth. There, there's a, there's one place you do that port job in it and it covers all the DEOPs. Um, kind of as a tangent, um, was software ever meant to be portable? Like, I don't if think portable software, be... software <laughs> isn't a thing, isn't a person. You're personifying <laughs> an abstract concept. I, you know, it's, I it's just that. To me that if, if portability wasn't like such a big concern, like we could have all of these exotic architectures, but now it is. Every new architecture that's like CPU like has to be. Somewhat, like you know, well, like, no, kind of well functioning with the framework of thinking, right? Versus like right, something. Let's let, 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 let Matt. Sorry. We got the concept. Let Matt go. <laughs> but now Sorry. we have web assembly, so with web assembly, you can write <laughs> once and run everywhere. I'm pretty sure Cliff never heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> WebAssembly is only like the 15th in a long line of portable architecture neutral formats. Th these things have been around since the fucking 60s. <laughs> My yeah. argument is C code isn't really uh, portable. It's almost portable, but there's always some kind of like yeah. weird implementation detail that breaks somebody's yeah. system. That none of it's portable until you port it. And once you've ported it like <laughs> exactly. times, you're probably pretty good at porting in a port. I would argue that uh, code becomes, with the advent of compilers, code, that's the start to, uh, for the code to be impossible. So that is the idea, to be able to port to different architectures. So is software meant to be portable? Since since the compiler, I would say yes. Well, so yeah, it's I mean... a hotspot to lots of different platforms. <laughs> There's piles of assembly I write for every one of those platforms. And there's, you know, piles of compiler, compiler descriptors I write for every one of those platforms. And it's not just assembly or this or that, it's a bunch of shit. But when it's done, as whoever was saying, whatever Aaron was saying, eh, your code up and runs. Yeah, I mean, a it, job can you run Java code on like GPUs, for instance? Okay, it's one thing to be able to run them, but can you run them efficiently to the like performance to the max? And like, you know, how well does any language that's like runtime constraint that defines like a particular rigid runtime can ever hope so, to so like capture an arch me, architecture that's like oh, far-fetched in the future. Let, let me let me give you some some flavor here. So sure, I put out please. the the C plus the Cliff CSV challenge a, a month ago, and the challenge is read a two and a half gigabyte CSV file, parse some numbers out, do some easy math. How fast can you do that? Well, the answer is is that Java gets as fast as anybody does until you start into like AVX ops and doing you know software pipelining as a register kind of things. Up until that point, and I can do software pipelining as a register, but I can't do AVX. Up until that point, I'm as fast as C code in pure Java. And the other languages that are not C based, not, not very low level with a sandbox, we're not getting close. And a bunch of people tried, they couldn't get Rust to go. Swift looked bad, but we couldn't get Swift to get a timing number. That was a different problem. But the, the reference counting was breaking Swift's performance. Um, you can get close, not counting GPUs yet, but outside of the GPU realm, you can get pretty fucking close out of Java for what you can get out of C code for performance. Now, is there a model that says I can do this for a GPU? 
Maybe. I don't know. There's a generic GPU-like model that Java model of jitting and code gen on the fly might get pretty close to. You know, take an open CL if it has the right kind of structures to describe GPUs in general, and then port to that, maybe you get pretty close. And then once you get close enough, most people quit caring about the absolute last bit because another 2x for another couple months work versus I got a whole new feature that enables a whole new market is way more exciting, right? 10x, that matters. That's enough that people care. 2x, like as a longtime startup guy, I'll tell you that 2x performance gains are hard to sell. 10x gains you can sell. 2x gains, not so much. Yeah, I, I can totally understand your uh, viewpoint. What I mean is like, I think... Like um, I was gonna, I was thinking about like a. Uh, okay, so oh, I forgot well, what you, I was. Gonna why don't you start. sort out your words and let's 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 yeah. keep the conversation rolling for yeah. somebody else, oh. and we'll come back. I sure. wanna, it's all fine. Sure. So uh, Hiram's law: anything that can be observed will be dependent on by anyone. Right. right. Uh, the, has anyone complained that Java wasn't working on some architecture because? There's a difference yes. in implementation. Yes, because when we went multi-threaded concurrent code and we supported to like ARM chips, there were lots and lots of, uh, uh, so the Java memory model has, was out and was new and was exciting. People were writing lots of multi-threaded code. Many people accidentally depended on the x86 memory model um, with Java, with the intersection of x86 and the, the Java memory model. And they went to a different chip, which had a different memory model, and it was still valid Java, but it wasn't also x86 model, and they would break. And then they would complain that Java was broken, and then it took a while for people to agree that, oh, no, their Java code is broken. And they rewrote their Java code to be safe according to the Java rules, not according to the x86 rules. Some of their code was portable and ran concurrently, parallel, fast, blah, blah, blah. It, was all, it all did the right thing. There was definitely a learning transition. Double check locking was one of the canonical poster yeah. childs of where it looked <laughs> yeah. like something. And, you know, it was x86 saved you and no one else did until then the JIT came along and broke you anyhow and you still had to do it the right way. Yeah, I, I know I irritate some people by saying that stuff is importable, but it, things break all the time. It's so annoying. Yeah, I mean, I'd say <laughs> it, it kind of like it's almost an academic question of whether or not something is portable. It, it's a question of from an, there's a computer science, like, is this thing portable? And I'd say, well, let's start with, does your language have a formal semantics? Because if it doesn't, then I'm, I'm going to argue it's not portable because right. your language isn't defined uh, it, in and of itself. Like it has no intrinsic mm -hmm. definition of meaning. Sure. Um, but then from an engineering perspective, it's like, well, I don't care if it's got a formal <laughs> semantics, like there's I can do work with semantics. it. Right. That it's got like a useful semantics and that's called it can make my code run. And when I'm actually building software for to solve a problem, I care whether or not the problem solved, not whether or not the semantics are are exactly documented. Yeah. Um, exactly, exactly. And problem solved in my definition is that the compiler generate the code that I asked it to or that, that I needed it to. And like if it's like a mature compiler, it probably did because it was battle tested. If it's not a mature compiler, it might have bugs in it that's like, you know, subtle. And then you have to go and examine assembly. And like, it's at that point, bugs. I realized like, I just, sorry? No, it's not the bugs. It yeah. implemented the, the non-semantics in a different way. The undefined behaviors in the C land have differing implementations on differing mm -hmm. platforms. And you are depending on this particular one. And you change compilers and you got a different undefined behavior. And so you broke and you're saying that's a bug. No, that's allowed in the language spec. So it's not a bug, except it's a bug in portability, but not a bug in the compiler or the implementation. Yeah. Right. Oh, and it's even, I, I would argue that C's undefinedness is the thing that makes it so portable, right? Yeah. Like that there are, if you give a formal semantics to many languages, including C, you have to pick a semantics, and sometimes that's simply not efficiently implementable on some yeah. strange architectures. Yeah. And that's why people are like, the undefined behavior is so important for for compat or sorry for portability in C. Yeah. And it's like it's not really because yeah. like you Nobody couldn't knew that implement a, a particular semantics. It's <laughs> yes. not efficiently doable, and so they're just kind of like like pointer prominence, right? Like, okay, what about 
language or systems that can't really do pointer provenance in the same way. It's like, well, look, do you want to run on that or not? Cameron should say again what you just said. No one could have ever predicted that the byte would have eight bits. I lived in that era where there were seven bit byte machines. I know that. <laughs> don't don't forget thirty six. Uh, that was four nines, right? I thought it was a thirty six. Well, it was a thirty six bit. I think word. it was four. It was yeah. four nine. As IBM bit right? bytes, yeah. Yeah. Right. Some networking yeah. standards specifically could use the word octet. Which maybe is not a bad idea in retrospect. Yeah, people were trying to get into some kind of portable notion there. Yeah, yeah. I did have a request by Honeywell to port Hotspot JVM to their 36-bit machine that was being used by the FAA to control plane flights the world over. That was a little scary. Java for Does find something like you cannot have multiple threads, the code can strictly uh, run sequential, yada, yada, something, something. I'm sorry, does, what about? Uh, doesn't, or was it the plain software that oh. it doesn't need to be multi-threaded, it doesn't, it have to strictly execute sequentially? The, the software run by the FAA on their Honeywell machines, or are you talking about the hard real-time software running the plain avionics? I thought you were the plane, but you were saying no, no. the hard. Yeah. No, no, the, okay. the the ground control. Yeah. Okay. okay. No, that was that was a weird nine bit computer, and we eventually told them no. They actually okay. not the reason we said no. We told them no because for their computer security model, code could only be loaded from disk with a flag that said I've been compiled by the correct compiler. You couldn't throw code into a buffer and then call the buffer and execute it, which is totally mm -hmm. what Java does. All that jitting yeah. shit, he writes code in buffer and he calls the buffer. Yeah. Well, I can't do that on a Honeywell. And I was like, well, you just have a tape drive standing by and we'll write to the tape and then we'll read from the tape and we'll go again. This, this, these are great. I love, I, so th this stuff predates my, my work. Uh, so like, <laughs> I love hearing about these we we, we have some setups. history that comes from yeah there was a time before the world, yeah, yeah. all the world was not an x86 uh what's the other one uh, um harvard model it was not always a harvard model yeah when i was working with Neil i mean Baxter, i think it I made more sense back well. in the days to target the architecture directly than to try to make it portable for like a lot of different architectures because like the landscape was like so um yeah it was all over the map it was so wild yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah right okay so andy you were you were you were cut off say it again oh i was just saying i i get a lot of these stories from people i work with who have been oh. around a lot longer than i have uh so like yeah the, the java stuff from neil gafter and oh, yeah. the uh the people who worked on the clr back in the 10 days and talking about all these things of like oh yeah we were bringing up these systems and had to make these interesting design decisions that we just don't care about anymore it's like oh i don't care about a system that mostly well we mostly don't care about systems that like don't have a uh, faster processor than like 200 megahertz or something like that well so really virtual virtual memory. Some... do you ever work on a machine with no virtual memory yeah right right or segmentation like or segmentation. segmentation i totally anymore. did fucking segmentation x86 is stuff not with I, java but i still have no idea how, i still have no idea how a pdp works. simply yeah you could probably figure it out as yeah, opposed it, to it any of the modern simpler. architectures where i don't know yeah, much, you, could much figure, you could figure it out with a magnifying glass exactly because because by the way the russians did <laughs> oh, oh, probably. Yeah, I could believe that. Gene, what was the PDP you guys reverse engineered? PDP six. Eleven. Eleven. They, yeah, they reverse PDP engineered 11. the right. PDP eleven with you know microscopes and magnifying glasses. Right. I think PDP eleven had base and bounds, no virtual memory still. Segmentation, base and bounds. The good old days, like. Bring back the good old days, actually. Like, well, what what happened to the segmentation that, idea? That wasn't no. They, they weren't so good, because the early days were the, were the days for experimentation. So now you kind exactly. of have a model, a model that it works. It does. Everything the job. is boring now. It's it so boring. That 
second I assume, edition. I assume would bug some like of that. You, uh, Bugs. Yay, you're, bo- yes. I assume bo- some of you watch the, uh, there's a guy on Twitter and various other medium that uh, reverse engineers uh, x86 chips and so on as, with a microscope to figure out the logic. Yeah. Uh, Matt, you know who I'm talking about, right? And then he also did the um, the Russian guidance computer, which is mechanical. Um, yeah, exactly, Cliff. <laughs> it's like it's the like Greek a, arithmetica or whatever the, the yep, gears. The, <laughs> something about Cyrillic characters makes people crazy. I tell you. Gotcha. Okay. Oh, Matt put a link in the chat. We have to go. I haven't even looked at the thing here. Oh, there it is. Ken yeah, Sheriff's blog, right. reverse engineering Ethernet back off and the Intel 8256 network chip died. I just, I just cost Levo two weeks of uh, two weeks of work. Sorry, Levo. <laughs> no, it only take him three days. <laughs> wow. Okay, fine. Okay, next topic. Yeah, next topic. It's time. Sorry. Um so I was I was thinking of something, but I forgot it again as I was going to get to others. <laughs> all right, all right. Get get a piece of paper out. Write That's it down. A good idea, the next okay. conversation okay. break. Wait, wait, I I remember. So I think like one thing that's like um required for to be able to run on like, you know, any kind of architecture is to make like no runtime assumptions at all. Like I think like the ultimate language is essentially like a um, meta language that compiles to everything, but you have to write out everything. Like you have to write the compiler also in this language, and then like you can have multiple compilers for doing like where, different where, kinds of stuff. I think. Where are you going with this? Uh the just concept, but no, nothing like that exists. Oh yeah, I could share like a screen, <laughs> like for. <laughs> yeah, Andy saying uh, standardization. Formally specified, you know, it's fully portable. It's, it's just you might not like the language. Uh, I, I, I mean, specifications are it. always. Sorry. <laughs> I, I think formal specifications are like, you know, um, not that interesting because, like, what can I actually do with it? But, like, I, I, I just want to be able to generate some like optimized code that I don't want to have to write the optimizer for because like then I have to test the optimizer and then I have to check the like assembly output this, to see if the optimization this works. why all chips like, start to look alike because yeah. the hardware guys have brought, got on the, the, the side of their side of making physics into chips, um, but they need that giant software stack and the software guys find it difficult to port to all these weird architectures. So we've kind of aligned up to where chips all look something alike because it's just a better, more efficient use of the world's engineering resources. These guys make things that look like a three address risk like thing with a TLB and virtual memory and whatever memory buses, blah, blah, blah. And these guys target their compilers and high level languages to it. And, and, and the, you know, there's friction at the border, but not so much as there used to be. And there's that, only that, three uh, kinds of instructions. Jumps, uh, moves, and uh, math ops. Uh, but the math ops is contained. Uh, uh, there are uh, approximately a billion instructions in the math ops camp. Yeah. Well, yeah and I'd argue that a jump is just a move anyway. Well, aren't so they if you're going to do shared memory, concurrent shared memory, you need some sort of atomic thingy. And that's uniquely different. You know, load link store conditional CAS is a claim. Well, at, least our, at least ARM uses CAS now. Any contemporary ARM architecture supports CAS, which is good news. Perhaps. And then you need some chip, some instructions that control the chip's internals, like for TLBs and virtual memory. But I think and, that even with the ISA convergence, if we can call this convergence, we are still going to need to optimize per chip. And I think that holds even within a single ISA, so that may be one of the challenges for the ARM SVE, for example, because the talk is that SVE, that's the scalable vector extensions, and in contrast with the Intel AVX, it allows you to scale the size of the vector on different hardware. So you have one specification, but one CPU can have 256-bit vector, another CPU can have 512, another can have 128, 
and, and you write the exact same assembly with the exact same binary and it is hmm. the responsibility of the cpu using those scalable adaptable instructions to adjust to that like count the number of the elements you are going to process per loops or mask of the tail of the loop using predicated instructions that kind of thing the problem with that is that even if you could you can emit run the same binary usually when you do this you are using SV because you want to have vectorized code, which is the highest performance code for things like blast, lap, matrix operations. And this you often have to tune for very, very, very specific mm -hmm. characteristics of the chips, like the TLB size, L1 yeah. cache size, L2 cache size, L3 cache size. What is the memory? Is this HBM2 memory or is this DDR5 memory? You are going to have different tiling strategies for those bit matrices if you are targeting different memory hierarchies. And that kind of may defeat this to some extent or may make it a challenge to be as adaptable because even if you have a single ISA and single binary, you still want to maybe emit different versions of that binary for different particulars chip. So this gets into the whole uh, 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 FFT transform generators that uh, spit out different well, tiling breakdowns, block breakdowns, but you could do them totally at JIT time. The JIT comes up, he asks the question, even Java, I bet CLR does too, like, how long is the cache line? My mem copy is going to prefetch. How long is the cache line? Well, let me go ask that question. And now I know how big my caches are and how big their lines are. And then I go generate my little assembly stubs for doing mem copy at that time that are cache line specific. I think there's still a lot of unexplored area in staging. And in staging, I mean things between the compilation time and between runtime. There's plenty of things that you can do, especially on cell phones at load time. Because once you are already loading an application that has been downloaded from the store, at that moment, you know a lot about hardware. So things like fat binaries that you download are not, that I think someone has already done something that. Is that why like that. installing a new app is so slow? Yeah, so this no is comment. why the CLR um, conventionally does NGen native generation at install time. So it okay. does pre code generation for the system architecture. Yeah. The problem is it's a fucking nightmare. Um, so the the two things are they're really the the new way of doing it, which is called ready to run or cross gen, is much better. Um, but it uh, gets lower performance, and the reason is because it's effectively like. A .NET assemblies are like compilation units, independent compilation units. Yeah. And um, if you native generate code that takes advantage of knowing the architecture and the other compilation units, then you can achieve higher performance by taking advantages of, uh, take advantages of the particular layouts of everything in there. Um, but then it's really hard to swap out that native compilation unit. You tend to not only have to swap that one out, but all the ones that depend on it, right. which can yeah. end up recompiling the entire framework. Right. Um, so if you ever do a Windows update and see that it's just like chunking in the background, yes. it's because it's recompiling every piece of the .NET framework for your machine post the update. Is there, is there a way to really wow. stop Windows from updating? Because he, he blows off about an hour's worth of window placement layout and bring up things every time. And I tell him no, and I tell him no, and he says, I'll let you stall a little while. Architecturally, it's just, it is what it is. It's As far as I can tell, it's like, no, because the security updates need to swap out components and they need to be unlocked, and therefore this machine needs to be restarted in order to unlock the so binary so remember, they can be swapped. You have to remember, too, that the, the, the coding methodology used at Microsoft over the decades has been, has been write-only. So <laughs> yeah. everything that was in Windows 3.0 was zipped up and put into Windows 3.1, which was then zipped up and put into work groups, which was then zipped up and put into 95, which was then zipped up and put into 98. So somewhere inside Windows 11 is a full copy of Windows 3.1. Like nothing ever goes away. It just piles up and they have to, and the fact that they get anything to work ever is just a freaking amazing feat of humanity. Back compatibility. Like, well, I wouldn't go that one, far. <laughs> back compatibility, priority two, anything else, right? Uh, but then yeah. also like, there is a strong security requirement, right? That, you know, you you install on a billion machines, you gotta make sure that those billion machines 
have some semblance of I, I would have to take stuff. the lack of security on my machine, which I do start by by gutting all the bloatware that comes down and shutting off ninety nine percent of Microsoft services as yeah. my first step towards security. It's yeah, it's it's so it's so like, but it is what it is. Like you got to set some software update right. requirements, and that. Well, well, I was hassling look. you as a proxy for Microsoft. I'll stop yeah. now. No, I mean, <laughs> policy. Policy is set somewhere up the chain, and then right, it right, just right. Falls you, down, you are right? not the the you're not the the, the designated whipping boy or something. <laughs> <laughs> like the, the thing with like you know piling up like source is like. The performance problems also pile up constantly. And like last time I tried Windows 11, like I right click to open, like on the desktop, I right click and there's like half a second like latency, like, you know, where it just freezes and does nothing to open up something that was like instant, just like, just you be, know. Just to be fair, though, most, really of those, most of those horrible pauses are the things that you installed that weren't written by Microsoft, just, just to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> The amount, so, of, I mean, the amount of crap stock Windows 11 experience, like yeah. from stock install, and then like I right click, all right, all and right, right. We're, like we're they never even tested this. We're done Sorry, you're using the antivirus software. It's probably your fault. But there is <laughs> one particular to... restriction that that Windows has, which Unix doesn't, which is that um, uh, running programs lock their binaries on disk, and that means that they can't be updated underneath. Um, and so that means that I think that's like one of the root causes, I think, of the forced restart, because your system can't, up to, can't update things underneath running programs, and that follows through with the requirement to restart. Right, right. Yeah, I had a number of uh, crashes and bugs when I updated my system but didn't do the restart. And the one thing that bothers me about Linux distros is that Linus doesn't control it. So Linus says don't break user space, but distros they'll break themselves constantly, and it annoys me so much. Yeah, the yeah, big benefit of the Windows and the and Mac, I'll I'll say both of these do it very well, is the uh, stable ABIs for the system, which Linux doesn't have, and it frustrates me to no end. It's like you cannot ship binaries for those platforms because yeah. there is no stable binary compatibility. Like, I just okay, fine. I'll compile everything from source every time, I guess. Like the only like it, it, there's not even like a system call to load the DLL or like load the symbol through like DLL like in Win32. So like there's load library. It's, it's, or there's sorry, there's a uh, DL open, but like. It's just yeah, not but you cannot embed possible. that into like a static executable like it's or like I, or I haven't been able to. I think like there was like Andrew Kelly who did all this work to include like libdl as part of like Zig or yeah. I mean, and yes, yeah, I remember GLC. that. Yeah. Oh my god. That, I mean, <laughs> the thing honestly... is like okay. Sorry, uh, the thing is like okay. Have you not? like thought of like dynamic linking at the OS level at all, even though it's like a huge part of the whole OS, except for some distros that are like totally statically compiled. All right. And like the right, elf complexity is like off right, the hooks that, compared to that. You are, you are charging on and, and ranting. Let somebody else talk. <laughs> Sorry. It, it's a huge <laughs> I, problem I though. Them. I will say that the inability to like target and deliver binaries for Linux systems is one of my biggest headaches, if not my biggest headache. Okay, so I was playing around with uh, st uh, static uh, static executables on Linux again. And uh, one thing I accidentally read was um, VDSO on Linux. Uh, the man page mm -hmm. just said that you can actually uh, have access to the ELF that uh, describes uh, the symbols, tables, and whatever for a VDSO. So I was able to write some uh, C code that uh, went into the aux auxiliary data and figure out where the get, get clock and get time of day function is. So now without using a dynamic loader, I can actually make uh, a system call without doing a system call. It just uh, calls the, the VDSO that uh, Linux ejects to every binary. It's pretty fun. I mean, you can do system calls within like a static binary anyway. Like, you know, that's always like, 
or in, in a dynamic binary also if you want to. But like the thing is you don't need like dynamic loading for that. The thing that you need dynamic loading for is like if you want to use Vulkan on Linux, for instance, or like the X11. Like um, I have a friend who's trying to like, you know, not do not use X11, LibX11, but do the whole X11 thing by doing system calls because like that's the only portable thing that you can do on Linux is like just use system calls and ship a static binary and like um, interface with like whatever like driver that you're interfacing with through system calls or IO controls is like the only way, which is why like static batteries usually just, I mean, static binaries usually for servers or yeah. Anyway, like, it's, it's a huge pain point because like you cannot ship a binary in an operating system. <laughs> like it's insane. All right. Yeah. yeah. I'm trying to figure out how to get uh, static binaries to work well in my uh, compiler, in my language. My runtime is tiny at the moment, but it also doesn't do anything. So uh, I got to get it on that. Yeah. All right. Are we ready for another topic or are we already be done? Somebody has something I mean, else that you want to bring up? I am full of topics that I want to talk about, <laughs> about like very philosophical questions. And only if like, it you know. like goes short here. Cliff, I have a, oh. uh, I have a question yeah, well. for you. Yeah, sure. Um, how do you, uh, do you think you could describe some of the philosophical differences between Grawl and the conventional JVM architecture and like how that whole thing is building? Great question. I like. So like, there's this weird, I want to say tainted history between me and the guys who started the Grawl project. And as such, I more or less like blocked it out of my mind, the thing I wasn't going to look at. Um, for many, many years, well, in the beginning, I came in as a naive young engineer with full of vim and energy and was only ever brutally honest with my opinions about shit. And the guys that were working on the JIT, I looked at it and said, you'll never get this shit to work. What are you doing? And here's why. And they didn't take that very well. And I would have to say I was probably fairly uh, abrupt. So I ran off and did C2 and crushed everybody. And then they came up and said, well, we're going to do C1 because, you know, Cliff's an asshole. And I don't like his coding and it's all crappy stuff and C2, C1 will beat C2. So they convinced management at Sun that, that C1 would win and they got funded and they charged off. And I looked at what they were doing with C1 and said, that's an interesting price performance point, but you'll never catch C2. So Sun funded me too, because I was the obvious winner of the moment and C1 was the competitor and the C1 never caught C2. And these guys, some of them didn't ever quite uh, like how that turned out, like emotionally. And they ran off and some went to other companies and started interesting own large projects that are currently ongoing and fine and doing their own thing. And um, some ran off to Sun Labs and out of that came like a Grawl effort. But there was a lot of uh, assumed bad blood between the leaders of the Grawl project and me that I long ago gave up worrying about because I've been fucking top dog for 20 years. I don't fucking care. Catch me. I quit. I, I, I quit running this race. You're welcome to race all you want. So you can beat me. So they eventually settled down and quit being, I'm going to say, antagonistic, you know, off, off, colored off to the sides and we were you know had reasonably good public relations since then and we could talk and pass questions around and i kind of looked at what they were doing and kind of said go for it guys i don't care you yeah, got a Tal long ways to go talia who's on the call so used to be I, used to be on the grill team at uh, oracle yeah i interned with them for five months in switzerland um from my perspective they've done a really good job at uh, improving performance. So in most benchmarks, Grawl actually beats C2. Um, and um, with it being written in Java, I found it really easy to code on. Like I hacked together, my project was a, um, implementing strip mining for counted loops. And writing that in Java was uh, pretty straightforward. I, I I assume so. The, the the thing that bugged me for a long time, which I quit, I got over, like I said, I got over a while ago, was that they would claim they would beat C2 
And then in any large scale, uh, uh, big corpus, they were below C2 for a long time, but there would be cherry picking benchmarks. And that, that ticked me off, the cherry picking benchmarks. Um, that kind of slowed down. And then, and then now I can believe that they're, they're at least at par and you think better and maybe they are um, than C2 on, I don't know what set of benchmarks you're looking at or how you measure but they've gotten better at least about uh, broadening what they call better. I, yeah, I'm so actually really curious about the engineering um, there, like the, um, the writing it in Java, the maintenance cost, how uh, did, is the development strategy any different than the JVM with Grawl versus the JVM with C2, that kind there's of thing? A long, there's a long history there and it's pretty ug ugly actually internally. So. Uh, Grawl came up through the through the labs group. I had some really talented people working on it. And these are people who have never shipped code, um, meaning they've built lots of cool things that end up getting picked up by other people and turned into code, but nothing ever that a customer had used. And so it was a research project. <clears throat> and then they hired a, well, they brought up a manager who was a bit of a douchebag who's whose main job over the past 10 years has been driving off good engineers. Uh, I won't use names since this gets pushed onto YouTube, but um, whatever, whatever you do, don't ever hire anyone with ES as initials. Um, and uh, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so, uh, uh, so he basically wanted it to be his you know, feather in a cap. So he pushed it. He pushed um, the entire pile of stuff onto the actual Java team and said, you need to ship this as a product. And uh, he had some leverage. So basically went out in the wild and then 90% of the Java team was busy trying to fix bugs and support it. So it was, um, it, you know, there's good technology, but it wasn't ready for the market. So it was developed kind of in a different part of the organization that wasn't used to building products, you know, um, a research lab and it got productized too abruptly. And so it's had, it's had long growing pains, uh, as a side effect of that, but you know, it's doing much better now. Just took five years longer than it should have. And, the, the so the leaving aside, you know, um, various, uh, organizational squabbles, which are inevitable, but also, um, maybe not interesting broadly, uh, the engineering, from an engineering perspective, I, I definitely see the difference, the difference between research project and engineering. Like they, they just are. Um, so how did it make the switch, the transition? Is it still, let's say, significantly different architecturally than the hotspot JVM in oh, terms yeah. of ongoing yeah, maintenance, definitely. ongoing production, those kinds of things? Or has its move to production software effectively kind of siloed it into the same space in terms of ongoing development? You can't change the architecture. That's the thing. It's well, one's, one's C++ and one's Java, but, but you're asking a different question. I'm asking a more, uh, like, let's be clear. I, I, I was a developer. I'm now a manager. And so I'm interested in the act of producing software. And I wonder if that architectural change, more than its performance benefits or whatever, has changed the act of producing Java, either in the people who work on it, the way that it's built, or the cost of building it. So one of the big projects that's under the Graal umbrella is the Truffle framework, which allows um, third-party language developers to use the Truffle API and define their own language. So if you want to compile your new foolang, you can write a Java program that's an AST interpreter. Um, and you don't have to do all the crafting interpreter style uh, tricks. You can write a naive um, AST interpreter that uses the Truffle API. And then Graal takes that and performs the second Fudamura projection on it and gets you out uh, an efficient um, uh, JIT. And uh, you get all of the power of the um, 
of the JVM behind that. And you don't have to think about any of that building your client language. And um, they've been able to do really cool things like getting fast native um, interop. Like they have Sulong, which is for LLVMIR. And that um, implements the Truffle API. And so one of the things they did there is um, to get type information for C values when working with it in Java, because you have the Polyglot API, anything using Truffle can pass values between any of these client languages. So to get that working with C and it's relatively untyped land, they have uh, fat pointers instead of just a single word for the C pointers. And uh, it's got a table that it keeps track of the um, type information as things are assigned in an allocation and it learns what is sitting in that memory. And so you can do, for example, named property accesses on a C struct in JavaScript code that is uh, using that C code. All of so you're applying in Grel VM connected with Truffle. So you're effectively doing like re re Java reflection against C code in some sense? Yeah, um, except it's all transparent behind the scenes. Um, and it's interesting because what they've done with Sulong with a C has turned it into an automatically memory managed version of C. So like uh, free now does, it's a no op. Um, everything is freed when the last reference goes. So they do have an, a mode where uh, like if you use after a free that it'll simulate a failure, but the JVM is going to keep that reference around. And uh, so it, it can give you back the memory there because it still has it around. And um, so you can get memory safe C out of it. So when the you, interesting, you say it, it, when does it free the memory then? Um, it uh, when the last um you, as far as i know from reading a couple of papers on it and i haven't touched implementation but um as far as i know it's gc when the last pointer to it is gone as opposed to gc when a free occurs okay yeah fine thanks so that and then um Thalia, your experience with it was as, as like an engineering project was that it was pretty approachable. Like the, you mentioned that because it does like a, a Fidemura projection for you, you don't have to fully deal with the crafting interpreter stuff. So maybe people, engineers who aren't familiar with that could still be fairly productive in producing production systems. Or is it like, <laughs> somebody's not familiar can do the first pass, but then you have some advanced compiler engineer come in later and clean it up. Or yeah, some, I think there is, for, there are levels that you can get with your like optimization. Um, so a lot of people can get really far on just a quick use of the Truffle API. And then there's teams like what Shopify has done with Truffle, Truffle Ruby. And they've poured an immense effort into getting their uh, Truffle Ruby efficient. So they contribute to Grawl. They uh, do all sorts of stuff. So getting off the ground is easy, but you can also. Your, your sound is coming and going, Dahlia. Um, so, so, yeah. Oh, OK. Um, I heard you something about Shopify, and, and you go really far, and getting off the ground is easy, but, and then you cut out. Um, Shopify, uh, I mean, the point is you can use the API at an easy level and get a lot of gains, or you can go deep like Shopify. Okay. And then, uh, Theodore and then Leva wanted to say something too. 
it's for I I would just wanted someone to clarify for the audience since either Sally or uh, Andy uh, the Futomura projection to demystify. Oh, that should go in a link. That needs to go in a link. I, I'm sorry, I can't. the 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 short answer is that um, you can build a compiler from an interpreter. Is yeah. the theoretical result. Um, the actual practical result is uh, very complicated. Um, I mean, we find one here. Uh, so the first the... Futamura projection, the second, and the third. So... Yeah, surely there's a wiki page. I got all kind of bad hits here. Somebody, maybe Matt, come up with a a good link yeah, here. Yeah, I was I was wondering why you didn't turn to Matt at first. I well, because I thought he <laughs> might volunteer, chat. but I didn't want to Wait. say something. I found it on wiki. I got it. If Matt well, comes with a better link, that's a recent paper, 2019. That's actually posted. like. The first time I'm hearing this, and like it's similar to what I've kind of followed in my own programming language, is like I generate code to generate code to generate code to generate, generate yeah. code. Yeah. Like it's kind of um, like the idea. Yeah. Okay, yeah, this yeah. is Christian's paper. Nice. And then uh, Levo, you were you raised your hand for something? Uh, yeah. So I was just uh, wondering. I know the difference between uh, C of nodes and uh, non C of nodes compilers. And it seems to me one of the biggest differences is you can do optimize, certain optimizations uh, pretty easily in C of nodes. But um, I, I don't know what the C1 try to do. And I was wondering, um, what are the major differences in optimizers? And I have a feeling you're going to say it's mostly heuristics. No, <laughs> you, you, well, along the C of nodes concept, there's an IR thing. Like Grawl is using C of nodes like structures, as far as I know. Um, the classic yeah, IR and C1 has a classic IR, which would be a, a, a control flow graph with basic blocks. Basic blocks would have a list of IR nodes, basically ideal instructions. And then over the course of several rounds of optimization, you'd clean up dead ones or move them out of loops or whatever, and then group them into hardware instructions and register allocate and go to town from there. But there's a classic Two level control flow graph has a block. A block is a list of ops. Ops are uh, uh, not in SSA form, so they are they are starting out life as a um, three address, two inputs with a name. The name is a virtual register number and an output name, but no pointers to the prior defs because you're not in SSA form yet. So that's you know C one. Uh, Grawl said C of nodes a long time ago. I assume they have something very similar to what C2 does sort of conceptually. Um, I know there's a bunch of other folks who do C of nodes things. V8 group was doing something along those lines. And if you're not C of nodes at this point in life, you're probably like LLVM. It'll be control flow graph and basic blocks. Basic blocks have instructions. Instructions don't have pointers to prior depths. They have a virtual register number. I think the biggest difference in practice is nowadays how many layers of intermediate representations you have between the AST and your backend of the compiler. So if you think of more classic classical compiler would be GHG or Glasgow Haskell compiler, and they are lowering from the abstract syntax tree that they produce during parsing to a type checked representation, then do core expressions, and core expressions are pretty much just an elaborate version of lambda calculus. I mean, it's closer to system F with some extensions. And they can do a lot of optimizations, already being able to express what a closure is, what, what is a case when you have a case statement of a closure that is calling a closure. They're able to do language specific optimizations. From the newer languages, Swift, for example, Swift doesn't go from the AST to LLVM, but it has a Swift intermediate language as SIL and is able to optimize collections expressions. If you have maybe a hash table lookup, maybe you write something to a hash table and then you load something from a hash table. This would be extremely difficult to reverse engineer from a pile of operations on a low level IR like LLVM, but it is trivial to optimize this as a store forward in case on an SIL level. And similarly, you also have this for correctness. So your favorite language, Levo, which is Rust, for example, has multiple layers of intermediate representations going from high level intermediate representation to yeah. middle level intermediate representation. And MIR, the middle level, is actually used for borrow checking. 
So this this which is basically a compiler pass that analyzes lifetimes. Middle middle level. No, AI. no it's it's a, it's it's a Rust yeah. HIR and Rust MIR. Yeah, gotcha. it has nothing to do with the LLVM MIR, which is very very low level machine level IR, which is lives in the backend. Mm -hmm. It's just things okay. for the like, register allocation or gotcha. instruction scheduling. So yeah, so I think the language specific IRs are pretty much the main thing, and of course MLIR is a framework. The MLIR itself is not an intermediate representation. It's more of a framework for building your own intermediate representations. Those intermediate representations are dialects and they operate from a higher level to a lower level. That's why it's also abbreviated as multi-level IR. And machine learning compilers like TensorFlow or PyTorch, the MLIR-based version at least, are heavily able to utilize that for things like tensor expressions optimizations. And there's, there, so there is a lot of worlds between AST and the low-level IR like LLVM. I think that's that's the biggest difference today. If I end up doing optimizations, I might be calling other people optimizations pretty stupid. Just because uh, if I manage to beat them, then I'm going to be very annoyed and uh, let, let me might talk some shit. Let, let me let me encourage you to find um, softer words because the the long years of people being unhappy with how they were uh, 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 treated uh, didn't, didn't pay off. It wasn't worth it. <laughs> See, no one believes anything I say, so it feels like I can just say anything. No, you, you, you say some, you say some very interesting things. Sometimes you say stuff without good, you say strong words without strong proof, and we can easily find counters. And sometimes you say things that make you have to go think and go home. So you're, you're as a person who says interesting things, you are definitely a worthwhile member of CCC. <laughs> don't, don't say yeah. no one believes me because that's not true. Well, it ended up, uh, well, I, I don't think uh, Andy's on the Discord, but he said a lot of things I said yesterday on the Discord and it didn't seem like people were believing me, but I also uh, mixed up what C Sharp does. Uh, so you you mixed what, a lot uh, of things does. on the Discord, some of which was yeah. true and some of which was pretty blatantly not true. And some of which was unspecified, but could be read one way or another and different people read it different ways. So yeah. you weren't clear with your concepts and languages, like you were mixing up wasm as an implementation from wasm as what is allowed by the wasm spec and and yeah well i, I don't want to get into uh yeah, okay. wasm well, and, i'm just uh, saying there was a reason you you poke some people and got them lit up it's not that no one believes you about anything sometimes yeah, uh, i'm at a point helps. i'm at a point where i'm not going to believe what anyone says until i actually see a benchmark because i've seen benchmarks that uh runs it uh wasm in its own process not doing any uh, sandboxing and another benchmark that actually does sandbox. So it's hard to believe uh, benchmarks when they don't specify, specify what they do. But anyway. Benchmarks are always good because they do yeah. put some ground truth down, but you have to yeah. separate out the implementation of the moment from what the language spec will say you can ever do. Uh, that's a, anyway, and, so... and always the the nice thing about working in compilers is that you get the the proof of um, non determinism and uh, non computability that says that no matter what optimization you do, uh, you will never actually find the op the best optimization for all programs. Yeah. So yeah, congratulations, you will always be wrong. guys. It's pointless. Like we can't do optimizations for like you know any architecture because like. First of all, even if we did optimizations, we would have to check it, okay? And no, no one no, checks no, no, no. it. All right, all right, slow down. Then, slow down. Besides okay. getting late here, we clearly do optimizations all the time. They're clearly extremely useful. Everybody loves to see better, faster, <laughs> whatever. And yeah, the, the, we the, the, start from optimize form. That's why we optimize. If we start from optimize form, then we wouldn't necessarily right. need to optimize. So I, I want to back up to Levo's earlier question, though. No, I'm serious, back though. Up like Cliff talking about, you know, three argument uh, form and whatnot. Um, yeah. The basic concept, though, is there are two problems that you have to solve over and over again as fast as possible. Um, got Talia's attention. <laughs> The first is you got to spot the op optimization possibility. And the second is you have to put it in. So the second part is often called a rewrite. And the first part has lots of different names, but you could probably call it people in some cases and whatnot. Discovery so, analysis. Discovery analysis, right? Alias so, analysis. So, so yeah. the reason yeah. why SSA does well 
see it knows has been because it doesn't suck at either of those. Yeah. Am I wrong, Cliff? Like it's not perfect. <laughs> no, it's, it's absolutely it's no perfect data structure, but it just doesn't suck at either. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. If you have to leave it in one form and go through it a billion times, it better be fast and it better not suck at either. Yeah. Hmm. And and so, I, the, one of the certainly rules... better than using the RTL and having to build your own use dev chains. Oh god! So in, in a sense, in a sense, you that... get this pretty much for free. Yes, I live that life. Is... So the reason I brought is up that simple would... is exactly because I show you how to build it, walk it, analyze it, and rewrite it in ways that are really short and easy. Most of the peepholes that I've shown that I showed on that graph, although maybe you didn't see too many, but all the little math reshufflings. Those are generally one line of code to do the analysis. It's an obvious one line and one line to do the rewrite as an obvious one line. These are super easy to do these things. And that's the main reason I like C of Nodes for this. And when Simon was on a couple weeks ago, one of the things he said, I may get the number wrong, but this is what stuck in my head is he had like 14 different layers that they would drop. And I don't know if they've kept them all or whatever, but they had like 14 different structures that they yes. would transform through yes and maybe they've thrown some of them out or something but there's there's like so instead of having like one structure that they just recycle over and over and chew on and chew on and chew on they're like no no we'd rather have a perfect structure for this phase and then we'll move it to a perfect structure for this phase and so on so Fine. it's dramatically different but that gives you the idea of of like what what some of the trade-offs are anyway and if you think about it, it was pretty recent. Well, it's still contemporary era. If you remember GCC, it actually used to go straight from the abstract syntax tree to the RTL, register transfer level. And you had to do the optimization, build your own use dev chains on the RTL. And it was only in 2005 that they merged the branch introducing the GIMPO, which is the internal representation in SSA form for the GCC compiler. So GCC 4.0, that's how long it took. And then they were able to use SSA as well. That actually was an interesting change. I know a lot of people stayed for a very long time on GCC 2.95. Hmm. Because, yeah. well, not all of the code was written in portable C and maybe your code, your assembly disappearing at all three could make you think that the compiler had a bug even though it was your code. But it was an interesting transition. Yeah, I mean, the thing uh, is, do you use like file transforms for your if else, like, you know, branches, or like, do you use local variables, uh, like, instead of like, I mean, it's, it's like, if he, if you use local variables, well, if you could cast that local variable into a register, then like, you know, you didn't even need to go to the memory if you could like, you Also, know. all there C was also very, especially in embedded space, what was very common was so-called delay loops when you would write a for loop with a specific number of iterations, maybe 17,000, because that gave you, say, 300 <laughs> milliseconds on the one embedded chip, and then you would be very angry if that didn't work the exact same way on the new chip or the new version of the compiler. Yeah, that's that's yeah. interesting. I mean... All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it here, I think. We really? Rant on we had so much to talk about, though, Cliff. Come on. Like, <laughs> no, I didn't no, even no. get to talk my language that I wanted to. Like, <laughs> there, There's room for next week. There's like two hours on this meeting already. Somebody else wants to watch it. I don't want to hand them a three-hour thing. Their brains will melt. <laughs> I I was was not, comments. Not can, you can think of a short presentation for your language. Yeah, yeah. Doing Put together a next... well-formed presentation of what you want to show next time. And then we'll we'll find time for it. It's all good. Yeah. All right. Oh, great. I mean, it's, it could be like a long talk, maybe because like it's like culmination of like. It, eight there's years a lot of more work of it's, it's, a presentation yeah. that other yeah. people yeah. understand. Yeah. You know, easily and well. That's a oh. hard project, and you know, and there's your there's your challenge set before you for next week. Oh man, uh, the so last busy. thing I want to do was <laughs> maybe I'll do it in like right. a month or two when I'm not so busy. Right. And that you got yeah. to you got to you got to back off and let somebody else finish. Yeah. I want to finish yeah. down here. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I'm really looking forward to finishing my my x86 uh, backend because I want to test uh, what I came up for optimizations. It, I think it looks kind of like C of nodes because uh, I'm not too familiar with C of nodes, but I think it looks similar, but it's also uh, very right. high level.
So right, Levo, I really want to try it out and uh, yes. show it. Show us when you're ready. We're happy to see it. I think, yeah, I think it's going to be a gonna, month. We're going to claim done. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be a month. Anyway, just this was, this was a fun, practice. guys. Like, so, so nice to meet you. I mean, I had so much fun listening to the right. whole welcome, conversation. Welcome on out. Welcome on out. Welcome. Nice to meet you. All right. Okay, guys. Next week. Bye. Uh, Cliff, Bye, reminder, guys. Yeah. Cliff, reminder to invite others to Discord because some people are asking in the chat. Oh, if you want to get Discord. invited to Discord, um, say okay. something to send, or send me an email or whatever, and I'll, I'll send invites out. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Cool. Bye.